You're listening to What's Ray Saying, the podcast. Now, speaking primarily from my part of the country where I was born and reared, the southern United States in Richmond, Virginia, and the years I spent stationed in the South during my military careers in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, and spending some time in every other remaining southern state, I have concluded there is the existence of a long-standing and dangerous nostalgia for the past that some Americans long for. In America, where only the concerns of the few were considered worthy of consideration, a history not founded in accepted historical research, but grounded in an attitude supported by fiction. It was a whole lot better in the past when the colors accepted their place and everyone just got along. I think we need to return to those times. I mean, yeah, it was a whole lot better in the past when the, 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 the blacks just accepted their place and everyone just got along. I mean, we need to return to those times. I mean, just the other day I was speaking to Ray and I said, Hey, Ray, how's it going, brother? And he got all excited and everything. I said, man, just calm down. What's racing? What's racing? What's racing? What's racing? From the source of all black knowledge, excited by the growth of my newly hatched baby chicks, finalizing the syllabus for my upcoming semester with a podcast that has no sponsor, an orphan in the world of media, but proud. You're listening to What's Ray Saying, the podcast. I'm Ray Christian. A little history, a story, commentary, coming up. There was a period and place of imagined history known by American historians collectively as the Antebellum South. A history that makes no reference to the hardships of slavery or the widespread abuse of blacks. A history reinterpreted in a school of thought called the Dunning School, a reference to a group of Southern historians who shared a common thought regarding Reconstruction, that period of American history after the Civil War, 1865 to 1877, when all the Southern states' new constitutions were approved and the Federal Army ceased to occupy the South. More than just an interpretation of history, its teachings were an important tool in justifying Jim Crow. That's the name given to a system of races, laws, and practices that made blacks unequal to whites and all sectors of social life. Named after Columbia University professor William Archibald Dunning whose writings and those of his students comprise the main elements of this school of interpretation. 
that included numerous racist generalizations with little to no credible evidence to support these assertions. Now the main tenets include the following perspectives on all matters regarding blacks. Giving blacks equality was a mistake of epic proportions following the Civil War. Blacks abused equality during Reconstruction. Blacks had the intellect of children. Blacks were members of a race that has never been successful. Blacks had no race pride and no aspirations or ideals to be anything other than like white people. Blacks are emotional and excitable, and they are in the habit of carrying religion to extreme lengths. Blacks threaten the very nature of civilization, and for all these reasons, whites have good reason to resist and fear efforts to put blacks in positions of equality or responsibility. These theories dominated academic textbooks well into the 1960s and have been requoted, paraphrased, and cited repeatedly as evidence to reconcile the ugly past and to correct the future. Hundreds of later historians, white, black, Americans, and Europeans, including W.E.B. Du Bois, Kenneth Stamp, and John Hope Franklin, refuted these theories repeatedly, noting that none of Dunning's research included data supplied directly from blacks and that the overwhelming weight of historic research repeatedly refudiates Dunning's ideas, and specifically the notion that blacks did not and could not make major contributions in American affairs of any meaningful magnitude. Lacking appropriate research methodology and a racist agenda, this body of work has been all but rejected as mostly fabrication. Despite this, numerous books and internet sites still cite this work as real evidence of the righteousness of the Southern cause and justifications for widespread inequality. Current evidence suggests that, given many names and sources, many people sympathetic to neo-Nazis, the Ku Klux Klan, white supremacy, and Many conservative organizations are still influenced, if not directly, indirectly, by the Dunning School of Thought. Despite its lack of credibility and current teachings to the contrary, in its newest incarnation, in addition to Dunning's original tenets, the following has been added. Blacks were always wrong when they failed to obey white authority. Blacks are always angry about nothing, complain about the past, and are not focused on the present. Well, I guess there ain't nothing new under the sun. Everything old is new again. drill sergeant at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and by all measures, I would have to say most of the drill sergeants, when it came to issues of race, were more than fair. 
But still, there were a number of drill sergeants, white drill sergeants, who had what I would consider an above average contempt for black soldiers. Now, all of us, all of us drill sergeants, we often said things in our banter to trainees. We call them by silly names and maybe not so many complimentary names. But referring to trainees with racist references to skin color and nose shape bothered me. Come here, darky. What are you doing, black boy? Hey, big nose, who do you think you are? One particular drill sergeant, my off and on partner, he often asked me stupid questions that would piss me off, but I was a fellow drill sergeant. Hey, Christian, how come that all the black soldiers who come from New York always sound like etc., etc.? And I remember responding, well, maybe the answer is, how about I come over there and put my foot in your damn face? First sergeant, senior drill sergeant stood up. Okay, you guys break it up. Okay, let's be more professional. Hey, I'm sorry, Christian, I was just joking. No jokes, man. Some things ain't funny. I wonder about you. But he was a favorite. And it never went any further than that. Now, as drill sergeants, there were Army standards of respect, but it was us who interpreted what it was when it was disrespectful and when it was not. Now, the learning curve for drill instructors, drill sergeants, can be pretty steep. There are things to learn, cultural things to learn and to consider. An example, we had some Southeast Asian soldiers who would often smile incessantly when they were yelled at. And we had been trained to know that they were not doing this to be disrespectful, but culturally, frowning was a sign of disrespect. So they smiled to show respect. Some soldiers are culturally, religiously quiet out of respect. They don't ask questions. There's smiling, there's no smiling. And there are cultures where no questions are asked at all. And we learn those things. We interpret that. And for the most part, we are fair. But I would have to say that black standards for respect, much as it was when I myself was a trainee, and even now as a drill instructor, were higher than there were for white soldiers. My partner, he was always prone to rehabilitate white soldiers. See, real rehabilitation was the hallmark of being a drill sergeant. Being able to take this soldier, this civilian who knows nothing, who's having a hard time in marksmanship, marching, uniforms, regulations, physical training, to work with that soldier, to bring them up. As I said, to rehabilitate that soldier. That was something we all took a lot of pride in, regardless of race. But my white partner, with his pro-Confederate comments. See, military bases have a lot of old cemeteries on them, and it's often common in the South on military bases to see fenced off cemeteries, graveyards that have Confederate soldiers. He would look at these things and he would not help himself but to comment about how good they were, how good a job they were, and how they were just as honorable soldiers. And he just never stopped with the pro-Confederate noise. I don't know how many times I'd cut him off because I would say something to the effect, we're United States Army soldiers. In this environment, we're not trying to be history teachers, man. Why don't you keep it focused on the present? He had this anti-black urban thing about him. His sense of teasing and asking insulting questions 
from black soldiers who came from northern areas used to get on my nerves. More than once, I found him doing this and I would cut him off and send the soldier off to do something else while I questioned him about what he was doing. He often remarked, are you only doing this because they're black? You're trying to protect them because they're black? I said, no, I'm protecting him because he's a soldier and you're wrong. I remember when I heard about this young white trainee who had been overheard by a person who heard, by a person who heard, saying the word nigger in the child line. Whatever the case was, he wasn't one of my soldiers. He wasn't a soldier I was working with, but I was called to the office, and inside were several other drill sergeants, the senior drill instructor, the company commander. And there was this young white kid receiving the ass chewing of his life as various drill sergeants took turn calling him a racist, a redneck, a cracker, and every other form of insult you could imagine. I'm sure the word white trash was thrown at him several times. There were threats to court-martial him. There were threats to throw him out of the army. And as I witnessed all of this, I wondered, why exactly am I here? What is the point? I have no dog in this fight. He's not one of my soldiers. He didn't say anything to me. What is the purpose for me being here other than the fact that I'm black? I realized that my presence was just for show. Given the environment, this is what they brought forth to impress me. I was asked by the commander, now drill sergeant, what do you think? This was after 20 minutes of ass chewing on this kid. I said, I think this young, young boy, this young soldier raised in a trailer park, alcoholic father, high school loser, joined the army on his own, is probably no different than many of the non-commissioned officers here who went on to become drill sergeants, put in positions of responsibility and authority. Sacrificing him is not going to do anything for me. It's not going to do anything for the army. And it's damn sure not going to do anything for him. I wasn't impressed. Everybody's jaw nearly dropped to the floor. But there was a sense of delight. As the commander said to me and the first sergeant agreed that my attitude was absolutely commendable. They went on to tell the soldier how lucky he was, how fortunate he was. And I was told what a great attitude I had. But inside I was inflamed and burning up with anger. They were willing to sacrifice this nobody to illustrate fairness.
I have absolutely been taken aback by what I consider to be the recent rise in false equivalency. That is this false sense of what is equal and balanced. Recently, this assault on this single disabled white man, and awful and as reprehensible as it was, perpetrated by four black people who probably don't know a damn thing about politics and should be put in jail is somehow equivalent to the murder and killing of blacks by legal and non-legal authority for an unbroken chain of hundreds of years. Last year, in fact. Last month. Last week. Yesterday. And today. Well, this one is done. So, spread the word. Let me hear from you. I need to hear from you. Write me your questions, your suggestions. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter and at whatsraysaying.com. This podcast is completely self-supported. Self-supported and sponsored, lifted, carried, driven, flown, slid, taken up for by no one but you. It's a love podcast. A broken, dysfunctional, irregular podcast. This podcast is produced by me with special assistance from Dr. T and as always, the amazing Beach Gordy Brooks. Until I'm out. You have been listening to What's Ray Saying, the podcast. Hosted by Ray Christian. You can find What's Ray Saying on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. If you've got comments, questions, or feedback, you can always reach us via Facebook or by emailing what's Ray Saying at gmail.com. Ray says each episode is made with love, fatback, chicken feed, and fresh mountain spring water, but none of these are legal tender according to the electric company. To help this listener-supported podcast pay the bills and keep producing episodes like the one you just heard, you can click on our Donate tab on Facebook or go to paypal.me slash what's Ray saying. Tell a friend or two or 12 or 20 what you just heard on What's Ray Saying, the podcast. Until next time. Tell you about